Hey coders and welcome to episode one of our cache service playlist on the Google Apps Script course. In today's episode, we're going to be getting a better understanding of the cache scope. So when I refer to the cache scope, I'm basically saying who has access to the actual data that lives on the cache, right? And just like the lock service or the property service, we can scope the data on that cache to three separate groups, an individual user, an individual document, or the entire script itself. So before moving on, let's just take a brief uh, high level uh, look at all three of these. So again, we can create a cache that is scoped to an individual user. Basically what that means is that the data that lives on that cache, only that specific user who's accessing their own user cache uh, has access to, right? So they can, they're the only ones who can write data to that cache and also the only ones who can read data from that cache. If another user tried to, you know, uh, access their own user cache, then they wouldn't be able to see the data on that first user's cache at all. So this is really good for like private data, some like sensitive data that only that user should have access to. Cool, so next we have an individual document. Uh, so you can also uh, scope your cache to an individual document at a document level, right? And these actually only work for bounded scripts. So you won't be able to, uh, you won't be able to access a document scoped cache in a standalone script. But let's say that again, you have a bounded script and you know, for some reason it's, it's accessing multiple different documents, then you can contain the data that lives on that cache to just the document itself. So that whenever users access that document, um, they'll have all, a shared, basically a shared cache, uh, but they won't be able to access that same data if they were to go to a different document. All right, cool. So next we have the entire script itself. So basically this is the most public of all of the caches. Uh, and this is like, again, really good if you have that non-sensitive data, uh, that public data. So for instance, in our, in the last episode, we talked about the New York times, right? So if that is definitely public data, um, uh, you know, today's article. So, uh, this cache lives on the entire script itself. So anybody accessing that script will have access to the same data. Uh, so this is really good, um, again, for just the public data. Um, and we are going to use that a lot. All right, so the top three methods that we're going to be seeing today are git user cache, git document cache, and finally git script cache. So let's jump on and over to the code editor for a live demonstration. All right, so to demonstrate the cache scope, I have shared this script right here with two separate accounts. One is my, again, college email address, and then the other one is my normal uh, email address, right? Um, so we're gonna see how the scope of the cache uh, affects the different accounts. So it looks like we have two functions. One is put data in cache and the other one is retrieve data from cache. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at both the script, the user and the document cache itself. So first we need to actually access those scopes. So how do we access those uh, different scopes? Well, I'm gonna come up here to the top of the, uh, the file and actually write some global variables so that we can use these variables or these scopes throughout the entire uh, script. So the first one's going to be my script cache. I'm gonna set that equal to cache service, right? Our parent class. And then uh, we have three different options for the three different scopes. We have document cache, script cache, and user cache. So I'm going to first use this script cache. And then there are no additional parameters that you need to supply this method, so that's pretty nice. And just like that, we have now accessed the, uh, the script scope of the cache, right? Let's do that two more times for the user and the document. Oops, now will be the user one right here. And then this one will be the document cache. Cool, so then obviously we also need to change the method that we're using. So that will be git user cache. And then this one will be dot git document cache. Cool. So uh, we have two different functions. We have put data again in the cache and retrieve data from the cache. So, so first let's put some data in the cache. So uh, the data that we're putting is going to come in key value pairs, right? If I take a look at this method, uh, we can see that the, any data that we put in the cache uh, has to be in key value pairs. And this is kind of general for all caches, right? It's, it's gonna go in key value pairs. Um, so 
Uh, for the script cache, we're going to put in as a key today's article, and then as the value, so the actual data that we're storing, it's going to be the sun is shining, right? So that's going to be today's article, the sun is shining. Awesome. So that's going to go in our script cache, but in our user cache now, we're going to put a little bit more sensitive data. We're going to put the bank balance, right? And let's just say that our bank balance is 3,000. Cool. So now let me run that. I'm going to put data in the cache. And there we go. So uh, again, when we're logging out the script cache, we get a script cache object, same with the user cache. But because this script is a standalone script, uh, when we try to access the document cache, uh, it returns null for us, right? And that makes sense because again, document cache only works for document bounded scripts, right? Uh, there really is no document attached to this uh, standalone script. That's why we get null. All right, so that is putting data in the cache. Now let's try to retrieve that same data that we put in the cache um, and, and retrieve it, right? So again, we're going to get today's article and we're going to get the bank balance, right? From the script cache and the user cache, respectively. Cool, so now I'm going to run a retrieve data from cache. And if everything goes right, yep, so it looks like now the sun is shining from the script cache. And also, our user cache is saying that we have a bank balance, right, of 3,000. So this data, again, cache is temporary data, um, basically like a database, right? So uh, this data is going to live in the cache by default for 10 minutes. Um, so we're going to be getting this data every time that we call get on script cache um, and user cache. We're going to be getting this data for about like 10 minutes, right? Cool, so that is, everything is running properly. Now let's go over to our other account. And I'm actually going to refresh this just to capture any changes in code that I just made. Cool, so now um, let's try to get that same data, right, that was just put in the cache, right? So this is the same script, the same exact project. Let's see if we can get that data. So I'm gonna run this function, retrieve data from cache, and I want you to think what might come uh, back right in our low in our logger. So we're trying to get the uh, today's article as well as the bank balance. So let me run that All right, so we definitely got today's article right that was in the script cache So this is a public cache for everybody basically who accesses this uh, script or who runs this script, right? So we got that article today's article the sun is shining However, when we tried to access the bank balance off of the user cache that returned null and that is because this user's user cache is not the same as this user's user cache, right? So within my college email addresses uh, user cache, there is no such uh, entry for bank balance. That's why it returned null. However, let's say that we wanted to add our own entry for our own user uh, cache. Uh, let's just say a bank balance of 4,000. And actually, let's actually change the script cache as well. So we're gonna say today's article, instead of the sun is shining, let's just say um, the sky is cloudy. And then we'll also put an unhappy face. All right, so let me now put data, put that data in the cache if I run it. All right, so it looks like execution started and completed. Now let's try to get that data. Let's try to run this function again, retrieve data from cache from our main uh, account. So again, this is what we got before. We got the sun is shining and 3,000. However, we just put in a bank balance of 4,000 and the sky is cloudy. Let's see what happens. So again, I'm gonna retrieve the data from the cache. And it looks like now, today's article is the sky is cloudy. However, our bank balance still shows 3,000. And that is because again, we did not change. Um, when this user changed their own user cache, it did not affect the data within our user cache, right? However, the script cache is public, so when they changed the script cache to the sky is cloudy, that had an effect on our script cache, right? That is a public cache, and any and anybody who access the, accesses the script can have access to that script cache. Cool, so that is the script cache and the user cache. Now, uh, just for completeness, again, let's take a look at the document cache. So if you recall, again, the document cache comes up null. If it is a standalone script, you can't really access the document cache uh, from a standalone script. However, you can from a document bounded script. So I've just created this very, very simple um, uh, document right here. It's called document cache. And, and then I've also gone, gone to the 
uh, app script extension right here so I can make this a bounded script. And all I'm doing is just calling a very simple trigger on open. All that's gonna do is get the document cache uh, and it's going to put in that document cache when it was last opened, right? Um, if it, if, if, um, if, if anybody used the, the, uh, the, basically this document within the last 10 minutes, then that data is going to be stored and last opened so that when another person goes into that document cache or that document and looks in the cache, then they're going to get the date that it was last opened. And then it's going to alert in a pop-up on that spreadsheet that the last person came here at this time. If there was nobody who came in the last 10 minutes, uh, then it's going to alert no one has been here for the last 10 minutes, right? And the reason why it's 10 minutes is because when, again, when we put data in the cache, by default, it has a time to live of 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes, it's just going to delete itself uh, from the cache, delete this piece of data from the cache, and then it won't have that key anymore in the document cache. Cool, so let's see that in action. All right, so if I refresh this, basically simulating me opening it, uh, then we should get a pop-up after everything has loaded. All right, so it says no one has been here for the last 10 minutes, cool. So now if you recall, at the end of the script, we just stored new data in the document cache. So now if I open it again, then it should tell me that the last person to access this script came at, here we go, the last person came at November 8th at 10.15, and that is exactly the time it is right now. Cool, so that is the cache, the document cache in action. All right, guys, that's gonna be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. I hope the scope of the cache makes a little bit more sense to you. In the next episode, we're gonna dive into deeper uh, how to utilize this cache in an actual live demonstration, a real world demonstra dem dem demonstration. Cool. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this and learned something from it. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. It really means a lot to me. And I'll see you in the very next episode.